Thank you, Laura and Robin, for such wonderful music. We are called as a family of Christ's disciples, sharing his love in all we do. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We have pew pad um, registries on the end of each pew. Please make sure you fill them out. If you are a first time um, person with our church, um, please uh, look out the um, entryway and we have a special gift for you. We are um, also broadcasting this uh, at 89.5. So if uh, you're in the parking lot, welcome um, to our service. If you would like to be a worship leader for our Sunday service, uh, please let our office know. We have opportunities that are available for each um, person who would like to join us. Also, prayer cards are available in the narthex in your pews. Uh, our request for intercession will uh, be received. Um, just let us know, and their prayer cards will be collected during the first opening hymn. We are also using the Christian Education Series Follow Me for both children and adults. The adult Sunday school starts at 9 a.m. in the Harrington Parlor. The family of Ginny Willoughby would like to extend an invitation to attend her funeral service. The service starts on November 6th at 2 p.m. And there will also be a meet and greet that will start at 1 p.m. Trunk or treat uh, for family funds is October 24th. Please see your bulletin or weekly update for more information. There's no need to sign in. Uh, just show up and you will, will be welcomed. We are also continuing to raise funds for the roof replacement. Um, again, please see the information provided. The preschool would also like to invite congregational members to pass out candy and treat our students on October 29th. If you're interested, please contact the preschool office. Fred Cohn was in charge of our, one of our mission projects. They delivered 32 bags of food to the food project. Thank you for all who donated. And we have additional bags for the next pickup, which I believe is in early December. The men's breakfast continues on the first and third Wednesdays of the uh, month via Zoom. Please stand and rise as we gather into a holy time and space as we read, recite the call to worship. Bless the Lord, all people. O Lord our God, how excellent is your greatness. You are clothed with the majesty and the honor. God of majesty, we are constantly surrounded by your gifts and touched by your grace. Our words of praise do not approach the wonders of your love. Send forth your spirit. Lives may be refreshed. The whole world may be renewed. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we are all, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Join me in the prayer of confession. Loving God, although your greatness and power of love can be seen all around us, so often we don't see it. So often we tend to see the bad rather than the good, the negatives rather than the positives, the problems rather than the way forward. We can let our troubles, fears, and doubts take over and stop looking to you, floundering in the dark rather than walking in the light and being led and guided by you. Forgive us, Lord. Work in us by your Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your sword. Open our hearts and minds to you. Meet us now and help us to know you are with us, to know the difference that you make in our lives and to worship you and learn from you. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that we are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. As God in Christ has forgiven us, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us share the peace with one another.
Today's gospel reading is Mark 10, 35 through 45. Then James and John, the son of Zebediah, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let us sit on the right hand and the other on the left in your glory. You know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on the right or the left for me is not to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, Lord, it is over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Crystal. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. I'd like to invite our children to come forward. Good morning. It's good to see you today. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Well, today I'm going to declare that this is the best day ever. Does that sound good? They don't look very excited. <laughs> today is the best day ever. Come on. It's like a special holiday. It's the best day ever. Can you think of some things? What if I said to you, you can do today whatever you want to do? What would, you, what would your day look like? Universal. It's, I hear it's really expensive, though. Um, <laughs> what about you, Sydney? What would the, you said universal. Sorry, I, 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 got, I heard the wrong person. What do you think? What do you think? Doing fun things? Anything fun? She's easy. Yeah, so what if you could just do whatever you wanted? Breakfast in bed. My best day ever would be having breakfast in bed, going shopping all day, maybe just relaxing, watching a movie. Doing whatever you want to do would be the best day ever. Well, in the Bible story that we just heard, James and John wanted something that they wanted just for themselves. They wanted to sit on the right hand of God, right? They wanted to do just what they wanted to do. They were like, we got this. Everything's good. It's best day ever, right? But God doesn't want that for us. He doesn't want us to just do what we want to do. God tells us that in order to really be happy, you have to serve others first. You have to put others before you. What does it mean to serve others? What do you think that means? Yes, Sydney? Helping others. That's a really good answer. What else? What do you think? What does it mean to serve others? 
in the Navy, very good, right? We have people um, putting our lives before others. Those are really good answers. Helping someone up if they fell, very good, all right? So in order to truly be happy, we need to remember to have the best day every day. We need to put others before us, okay? All right, we're going to say a prayer before we head out to Sunday school. All right. Loving God, thank you so much for giving us this great day. It's the best day ever. Help us to remember to, to love one another, God. Help us to be servants just like Jesus was, to live in his wonderful example. And be with us today and bless this day and fill it with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. love that. We need more people to help us sing that song. It's easy. Because trust me, you don't want to just hear me singing it. That would not be a good day. But it's wonderful to be here with you all this morning. And thank you for the prayer requests um, that have been given to me. Did anyone miss an opportunity to lift up a prayer? All right, let us, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to offer our petitions to you in his name. Guide us by your Holy Spirit that our prayers for others may serve your will and show your steadfast love in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please hear these, the prayers of your people. Holy Lord, we thank you for all those in our community who put the needs of others before their own. We thank you for our first responders, our firefighters, our EMTs, and police officers. We thank you for the tireless efforts of our health care professionals working to care for our loved ones in hospitals and care homes, doing research in laboratories, and caring for those seen and unseen. We pray your peace be with them as they continue to care for those suffering from the coronavirus. We pray your compassion upon them for those they treat and their families and loved ones. Renew them in mind and spirit that their work is not done in vain. We pray that we may forgive first, offering whatever divisions stand between us to you and that we might be healed through your Holy Spirit. And we pray for every mother, daughter, father, son, husband, and wife who has been lost to this pandemic. Help us to remember that behind every number was a human heart and hearts broken by their absence. Lord God, we pray for an end to the things that divide. We pray for an end to racial indifference and ask that you help us to lower the temperature on our own anxieties and fears. We pray for your righteousness wherever bigotry and hatred still have a foothold. And we pray for the nations of the world where injustice is still rampant. We pray for the people of Afghanistan and especially for the women in that country and those on the margins, that their rights and humanity be upheld. We pray for the nations of Africa where children continue to be exploited. We pray for our nation as we come to terms with our own history that has left us as a people divided. Create in us clean hearts that we may forgive as we have been forgiven. We pray for our church family 
during this time of transition. Guide us that we may continue to be a place of welcome for all ages. We thank you that our preschool continues to grow. And Lord, how we love to hear the giggles. We pray for our members long absent because of the pandemic and look forward to when they will be able to rejoin us again in worship. We thank you that our borders will soon be reopened and friends and loved ones from overseas may be welcomed again. Lord, now we lift up the prayers of our loved ones here in this community. We pray for Muff and her family and for Beth. We pray for John Campbell, who remains in the VA hospital, but soon will move to Heartland. And prayers for Judy and John's friend, Jean, as she has suffered a stroke and is now hospitalized in South Dakota. We pray for Mason Middlebank, for Jay, who's recovering from heart surgery, and Melinda Thomas, who's being treated for cancer. Lord, we ask for healing and strength for Gary Connor as he battles cancer, and John as he begins chemo this week. Lord, we also ask for prayers for Jack, who's recovering from heart surgery and it's his birthday, so happy birthday, Jack. And Lord, we ask our prayers for Suzanne, who will be meeting you soon, leaving loved ones behind. Remind us, Lord, that as we say goodbye, you are there with open arms to greet us. We lift these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Holy God, you call us to be made holy, to be made in your image. We trust in your generosity and we trust so that our free and to be generous ourselves opening our hearts and our wallets freely, giving to the work of your church in our world. Bless this gifts and to your service. Amen.
Dear Lord, we worship you with our words and with our songs, Lord, and we praise you with our money. Everything we have is yours, and these offerings today are the work of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Please listen to God's holy word. So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming to those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life, but now you must get rid of such things. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another because you've stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. And so as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your heart, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Beloved, the word of God. Thanks be to God. Gracious Lord, as your word has now been read and shared, quiet our hearts and minds to new understanding and how we can be your people this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was the summer of 1969, long before many of you were alive. It was July, and three men in the size of a spacecraft not much larger than my Mini Cooper circled the moon. And on a warm summer day, two Americans won the race for space. They were the first human beings to set foot on the moon. One small step, one giant leap. A few months later, two other men walked off the 18th green of the Royal Birkdale Golf Course. It had been a contentious week. Tempers had flared between members of the U.S. and European teams of the Ryder Cup. And the outcome of the tournament rested on the shoulders of two players, Britain's Tony Jacklin 
and the Golden Bear, Jack Nicholas. Tony Jacklin on the 17th green sunk a remarkable putt, 35 feet long. If you're a golfer, you know how remarkable that is. And in sinking that putt, the match was tied. And so their nerves raw, they approached the 18th. Both landed on the green in two, but Tony's ball fell just short just by a couple of feet, while Jack overshot the hole. So going first, Jack hold the ball, and then walking over, picked up Tony's marker and handed it to him, saying, I don't believe you would have missed, but I would never give you the opportunity in these circumstances. Jack offered Tony a gimme, an act of grace, and the Ryder Cup ended in a tie. That moment is known as the concession, one of the greatest moments in sports history because in that moment, these two players raised the bar to what true sportsmanship can be. What does it, what does it mean to be a part of a winning team? Because we are competitive by nature. We like to win. You can ask anyone who has ever played Scrabble with me. I like to win. You know, and even scripture recalls numerous times when one man or tribe tries to outshine the other. We have Jacob who outsmarts his brother Esau for his father's blessing and Jacob's sons who sell their youngest brother Joseph into slavery. And of course, King Saul competed with David and, and with their sons, with one another. And even in this morning's gospel lesson, we find two of Jesus' disciples competing for the best seats in the kingdom of heaven. We want to be on a winning team. We don't want to be the last one called or on the Charlie Brown team just waiting for the football to be pulled away or be rained out on the pitcher's mound. We're Christians. We want to be good sports, but we don't want to be on the losing team, the team where the fans make fun of you and jeer at you, and that's if they even show up at all. But the kingdom of God plays by different rules. The first may be the last to cross the finish line, and for all of us who wish to take a seat at the banquet, we should be prepared to concede a bit of them ourselves for the benefit of someone else in greater need. I once had a member of another denomination say to me, oh, you Presbyterians, you Presbyterians, you just think you're going to be the first ones in heaven. And I said, no. We'll be there organizing the line. <laughs> Do Episcopalians offer better prayers than Presbyterians? Is the youth group that is jumongous at that non-denominational church down the road better than our youth group? Are the Baptists more engaged in mission? What about your neighbor whose political views are so different from yours? Are are they on our team too? We are called and claimed by God in Christ, but are we a good team in his name? Imagine for a moment a playing field, a field of dreams, maybe a field in Iowa, or maybe right here in Tequesta, and there's a diamond not the kind you wear on your hand, but the kind where you run the bases. And just behind me here, the Lutherans are standing in the dugout, ready to come to bat. And the Baptists are holding down first base. And the Presbyterian shortstop is trying to form a committee with the second baseman. And you have the Methodist on the third, worried about the runner who might backslide into home. And just then, you have the old devil calling, called life coming up 
to the pitcher's mound, just ready to throw you a curveball. You've got the angels in the outfield and the Dodgers and the bleachers, those who've heard the word of God but thought they'd come back on another day. And behind them all, the players, the managers, the coaches, and the fans is the umpire. And it's his job to make sure that everyone plays by the rules. A sports commentator once said that as the umpire, you are neither inside the game as the players or outside the game as the fans, but the game passes through you like rainwater through a filter. And it's the umpire's job to influence it for the better, to strain out all the foul balls and irregular plays. One of the most reviled positions in the whole game, and yet without the umpire, who would play by the rules. And that's Christ, our referee. To let the peace of Christ rule, to guide, to literally be the umpire of our hearts, to hold us in check when the temptations of this world are so appealing, and to call us into account when our words don't bear his name to cry foul when our actions no longer glorify God, and to wrap our lives in the love of God and let Christ's light shine through. Have you ever been at a baseball game and see the batter strike the ball so hard that the stitches break? And all that happens is that a core of strings just flies everywhere, and all that's left is the leather cover. There's nothing for the player to grab. There's no way to throw the ball for an out. And all that's left on the field is a, a loosely bound ball of string. That's what it's like when we step away from God. We might be successful. We might even be happy, but if we are honest, we know that there's still something that's missing. But when we confess that emptiness to God, when we, we turn over our lives, our minds, and our hearts to Christ, we change. We might keep unraveling from time to time, but once Christ becomes part of our lives, that that yearning to return to the game, to live in community with one another, and to let Christ be our guide becomes irresistible. Prior to his imprisonment, German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer created a community centered on Christ. The brethren in the community lived together, prayed together, worked together, quite literally, in the same space. They faced all the challenges that any family knows of life together, different personalities and habits, but their one central belief was that they lived their life in Christ. In his book on that experience called Life Together, Bonhoeffer writes that when we received forgiveness instead of judgment, we too were made ready to forgive. What God did to us, we then owed to others. In Jesus Christ, God gave us a gimme, an act of unearned grace. And all the competitions in the world will never change the outcome that Jesus Christ is the victor. He has overcome the world. So what does our winning team look like? First, it's the acknowledgement that this is not a spectator sport. All of us who believe in Jesus Christ are called to the playing field. There's a lot of work to be done. And we all have talents in which we can share. Second, there's no hierarchy on Christ's team. We each have these different gifts and talents to share. And those who are called to lead must be willing to serve. Third, 
A winning team is agile, well-trained with daily exercise spent in prayer and God's word. And fourth, a winning team is accountable. We need to be accountable to one another and to trust one another. And then finally, in everything we do, as an individual or as a team, we do in the name of Christ. I should add that the Ryder Cup no longer allows gimmies. Thank goodness God still does. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we are reading and doing our confession from the Confession of Belhar. This was written in the 1980s as the churches came together to speak out against apartheid in South Africa. Will you please stand with me and share in these words taken from the Confession of Belhar. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church of Jesus Christ, that through the working of God's spirit, it is a binding force, yet simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought, one which the people of God must continually be built up to attain. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing our closing hymn, number 354, Guide My Feet. team what can I hear a cheer like yes yes all right okay all right so let's go hit some home runs and may the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you may he guide you through the wilderness protect you through the storm may he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you May he bring you home rejoicing once again unto Christ's door. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God's people say, Amen. Amen.